subject of Christ the Mediator. And before we do begin that, let's pause and pray and uh, come to our God and seek his face. Let us do that. Our God and Father, we have been taught to come to you through the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit. And we do so tonight knowing that there is no possibility of us being able to have fellowship with you, communion with you, apart from him. And we do long that tonight as we reflect upon the person and work of Jesus, your Son, that you will open our eyes and deepen our appreciation of him as our Savior, that we through him will be able to walk more closely and humbly with you, that we will be filled with fresh zeal to seek the glory and honor of his name and proclaim his gospel far and wide in the world. Come to us then as your children tonight and show us how great your salvation in Christ is. For we do pray this in his precious name. Amen. Great. Well then, chapter 8. I hope you've all got your notes before you. I'll get our overhead up so we can follow that through here. Let's begin, shall we, by <clears throat> just looking at that quotation that I've got right at the top of our notes taken from our um, textbook on the Westminster Confession of Faith by Tom Wilkinson. He says, In modern times... There has been a pronounced tendency to treat the person of Christ from a functional point of view. Anybody suggest what he means by that? To treat the person of Christ from a functional point of view. Anybody? What do you think he means? The length of just 50. Jesus is what he died to save me. That's right. I think that that's fundamentally it. Uh, Hamish just said for our folk on telephone link, it basically means the occupational, possession, or, or, or interest in Jesus has been as the one who died to save me. And so there's a very, very functional concern. Jesus is the one that can heal you. Jesus is the one that can forgive you. Jesus is the one who uh, assures us of an eternal inheritance. Now, all those things may be true, but the focus has been so much upon the personal benefits derived from the Lord Jesus Christ that there's been little attention given to the dignity, the glory, and the wonder of his person and his being. So we've got here, attention has been given to the person of Christ from a functional point of view, giving centrality to what he represented and what he did, and largely evading the decisive question, who is he? However, the value of what he did is so ultimately and fully determined by who he is, as the confession of faith is fully aware. So tonight, as we begin our study of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and his work as our mediator, we do begin by looking firstly at the place of Jesus and the counsels and purposes of God, secondly at his person, then his mediatorial office, and then his mediatorial work. I might also say by way of introduction, and we could sort of say something a little more really than Wilkinson says here, the, the focus has not simply been just upon the work of Jesus, but I think it's true to say that in our age the focus has been so almost so entirely upon ourselves. The self-focus and self-concern that we have that Jesus is just there to serve us. So we've become, as we considered this morning in our lecture, and Tom was highlighting again for us the individualization and self-centeredness of our thinking and of our living today, really Christ is there to serve us. And he's there for us. And he's there to forgive our sins and so on. And what we failed to see is the place of Christ in the counsels of God, in the purposes of God, and, and truly there is a, a much bigger and glorious context and framework for considering the person and work of Jesus than most of us are aware of. So as we begin tonight, perhaps we can just do one other thing by way of introduction, and that is realize that as in terms of the writers of the Westminster Confession of Faith, they are they're following through their summary of Christian doctrine in a very logical and a progressive manner. 
They've spoken about how we can know about God. They've spoken about God. They've spoken about the works of God, the decree of God and creation and providence. They've spoken about man, his creation and his fall. And then last week, you recall, they've spoken about God's covenant with man. In other words, beyond simply God as creator of man, we've considered together how God's wanted to relate to man. And you recall last week we spent quite some time talking about the idea of covenant and how it's possible to view it just in quasi-legal terms and think of covenants in terms of parties and contracts and penalties and that kind of thing. And although there may be quasi-legal aspects in the formalization of God's covenants historically, fundamentally covenant at heart, there's much more a personal relational thing. And we saw that God, in making man in his own image, delighted and desired and determined also to enter into this incredible relationship of kindness, covenant love, faithfulness, and enjoyment and blessing. So, really the precursor to the Westminster Confession of Faith's treatment of Christ is is the idea that that God, having made man, desired to relate to him, or made him, always with the intent and the purpose of relating to him. He didn't just desire to relate to him after he created him. Always in his eternal counsel. He should have an image bearer in which he could almost externalize the life that he enjoyed within his own being. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit could also express the love, the grace, the joy, the kindness, the blessedness that exists within God himself, with man. And we speak of that really as the essence of covenant, relationship between God and man. Now, last week you recall that the framers of the confession saw a fundamental difference in the relationship of God with man before the fall and after the fall. We might put it this way. Before the fall, there was unmediated covenant intimacy between God and man. God was able to walk with Adam. God was able to relate to Adam. God was able to to be with Adam in an incredible, close, in a manner that was incredibly close, incredibly intimate, and didn't need a go-between. We could ask this, that in the Garden of Eden... Do you get the impression from those opening chapters of Genesis that that God and man were able to almost relate face to face? Do you think there's evidence of a mediator? Tom can probably, dying to break in and correct me in all these things, he'll, he'll just have to put up with my bad theology. But anyway, do you get the impression that prior to the fall, the relationship between Adam and Eve had to have somebody in between, between Adam and Eve and God? Or that there was unmediated covenant intimacy. I think that that's who it was. But the fall of man introduced death and brought upon man the curse of that because that relationship God had established with man, that covenant intimacy was dependent upon man being completely the servant of the Lord that we see reflected even in the servanthood of Jesus. Perfect commitment to the will, the glory, the honor of his Father. And the moment that that intimacy and that fidelity and that covenant faithfulness was broken, then there was alienation. Then there was uh, more than that. There was enmity came into that relationship. And there was separateness. And man died. And and the, the, the chasm that was there was not only the chasm between creator and creature, but a chasm also between a sinner and a perfectly holy God. So we noticed last week that That first covenant, as the Westminster Confession of Faith describes, which incidentally the Westminster Confession of Faith called that a covenant of what? Of works. But we saw last week that it's wrong to view that as a covenant in some way that's initiated or in a way uh, arises out of man's 
working. It's a, it's a gracious covenant relationship that God had with man, but it was dependent upon man retaining his uprightness before God. After the fall, God determines that there should be still covenant bond and friendship between himself, but now that has to take place, what? In an unmediated, or do you think a mediated way? Do you think God and man can now relate face to face without any kind of mediation between them? No, the understanding that the framers of the confession left us with it last week was that this second covenant, they call it a covenant of grace, a gracious covenant in which the bond of friendship and fellowship and intimacy and blessedness between God and man is now mediated through Christ. So all the enjoyment and all the blessedness and all the favor and all the inheritance of the promises of God are found in Christ. Okay? So that's the context of this. And that is behind the framers of the confession heading this chapter, Christ the mediator. He's the mediator of the covenant bond of friendship and fellowship between God and man. Well then, as we've got here, there's numbers of sections to look at. And we begin with this one that we have up here. And, <clears throat> hey, Gerald, since you've been having good chew at me today, what do you think of the way I spelled purposes there? Not, not bad? <laughs> there we are. Purposes. Sorry about that. Just forget that. Christ in the purposes of God. That's the heading that I've given this section. Because what does it say? It says this, it pleased God, it pleased God in his eternal purpose. And right at the outset, as we come to look at this whole point of the mediatorial role and work of Jesus, we need to see that this is not an afterthought. The framers of the confession do not say it pleased God after the fall of man to decide I need somebody as a go-between between between me and Adam and Eve. No, no. This is all part of his eternal counsel in which the triune God saw the end from the beginning. They saw all things with an immediacy and a completeness. And in the eternal purpose of God, it pleased him in his eternal purpose, what? To choose and ordain the Lord Jesus his only begotten Son, to be this. Now, again, can I just encourage you to look at this language here? It's so compressed, so exact, uh, and every part of it needs to be unpacked. In His eternal counsel, it pleased God to choose and ordain. The Lord Jesus, His only begotten Son, to be the mediator between God and man, the prophet, priest, and king, the head and savior of his church, the heir of all things, and the judge of the world. So it's saying here, the section I've, I've, I've again tried to analyze for it, God's choice of Jesus, its origin, its nature, and its purpose. Later on we'll see God and his eternal counsel, according to this formulation of God's working, also gave to him a people. But in the beginning, let's notice this. The ministry of Jesus, not only his ministry, but his person as the God-man, has its roots in the eternal counsel of the Godhead, in which God chose and ordained the Lord Jesus, his only begotten Son. Now, I might pause here for a moment, because amongst some of the, certainly the older historical theologians, Whenever they see this term, the Lord Jesus, they say, the Lord Jesus is properly the name of the incarnate Son, the theanthropic man, the God-man, the theanthropos, God-man, rather than the second person of the Trinity, the Son, the Logos. Now, I'm not sure how rigidly we can enforce that, but... I think it is important at the same time to, to be able to see this. To choose and ordain, we might also say here, to choose and ordain his son, or the second person of the Trinity, to be 
the Lord Jesus, the incarnate God, and thus the mediator. But don't worry too much about that. Fundamentally, we're seeing that the work of Jesus has its roots in eternity. And as I began, I drew attention to the fact of the, shall I say, almost the poverty of a lot of our contemporary understanding of Jesus. Jesus died on the cross to save my sins. He's there for me. Now, wonderfully true, <laughs> but we are being encouraged, challenged, forced to go back and think, no, no, we, we don't really just begin our thinking of the person and work of Jesus with us, with our needs. We begin it with this infinitely wise and good God who has a decree for the glory of his own name to create, embraced within that decree is that his creation or man, that Adam representative man should fall and plunge the race into lostness and implicit in that too is that he for the praise of the glory of his own grace would ordain his son to be the mediator between God and fallen man and redeem. So it's part of an eternal purpose and when we think of Jesus as our saviour we also need to see that bigger picture and what's, what's really behind that. The counsel of God for his own glory in which in eternity he purposed that his own son should be the mediator between sinful man and himself. And we'll see all that that entails as we go through this. So, he chose and ordained him to be the mediator between God and man. Now, everybody know what a mediator is? Let's have a look at our notes and perhaps just see where we're going here. You see, under this I've put in this heading, the section teaches A, that God in eternity chose and ordained His Son, the Lord Jesus, to be the mediator between God and man. Christ's role as mediator of His people has its origin in the eternal purpose and plan of God. Now, down a little bit we've got a couple of these quotations. We'll just pick up one of them. Quotation from Tom Wilkinson again. The word mediator is fairly uncommon in the Bible as a word though the conception itself is dominant. The idea is that because of our sin, God does not deal with his people directly, but through a third party. The word mediator is an umbrella word covering the whole work of Christ in achieving our salvation. Robert Shaw in his old commentary of the Confession of Faith says, a mediator is one who interposes between two parties at variance, to procure a reconciliation. A. A. Hodge, a mediator is one who intervenes between contesting parties for the sake of making reconciliation. Where do we use the term mediator today? Do we use that? What sort of settings? Mediators in? In what, sorry, was that Barbara? Court cases or in? Business, industrial relations when they break down, is that right? Industrial mediators. Somebody who comes between, what, two alienated parties and tries to bring about a restoration, a reconciliation, and a rekindling of a truly functional relationship between them. A mediator, a daysman, one who goes between and seeks to bring parties again into harmony and reconciliation. So God no longer deals with man directly in his sinfulness but through a mediator and in that mediatorial role and function the Lord Jesus serves as prophet, priest and king, the head and saviour of his church, the heir of all things and the judge of the world. This is in God's eternal purpose and conception for Christ that he should be the one who, standing between himself and man, should be prophet. You see in the notes that I've tried to summarize over the page, on page 2 there, some of the different functions. You see about halfway down page 2, as we uh, look perhaps at the functions that the mediator performs, that the prophetic office I've got here meets man's need of revelation on account of his blindness. The priestly office meets man's need of atonement and intercession on account of his guilt and sinfulness. 
And the kingly office meets man's need of, or function, kingly function meets man's need of government and protection on account of bondage to sin and Satan and in a hostile world. So, <clears throat> as the framers of the confession seeking to understand theologically where Christ fits in the purpose of God, mediator between himself and man, in that mediatorial function, providing the knowledge and the revelation of truth that man needs in order to be reconciled to God especially. Also, providing that atoning sacrifice and the priestly intercession that man is need of, and also as king, ruling, governing, and protecting and guiding his people. God doing it through mediator. Can I just ask, do you not think that leaving aside whether those terms are the most appropriate or not, but nevertheless, do you think that that idea, can you see what we're getting at here, that the, the role and function of Christ, as we begin to think of it in these terms, is, is bigger, broader, richer, fuller, than what we're often inclined to think? Beginning with ourselves, who is Jesus? Jesus is my Savior, and He is my Lord. Wonderfully so. But when we begin to look at it from God's purposes and God's determination that he should be the mediator between himself and fallen man, all of these rich ideas begin to come into being. Can you see that? Appreciate what we're talking about here. Okay, so he should be that head and savior of his church, the concept head here. As we read it in the New Testament, we think of, well, head in terms of governing and directing and controlling. But I think also in biblical terminology, it carries the idea of the representative of his body as well. That he is able to stand in the place of the whole. So he, in the purposes of God, is to be head and savior of his church, heir of all things, all of the promises of God, the inheritance and all that in God's intent and purpose for his people and for his creation, it should all be in Christ and ultimately the judge of the world here. So here, this is what the, the, the Framers Confession are trying to say at this point. God it pleased him. And that term pleased again in our study of the confession so far it refers to the absolutely unconstrained, free, good pleasure of God. Pleased him. Nobody was constraining him or forcing him to do that. Absolutely pleased him according to his eternal purpose to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus as only begotten Son to be the mediator between God and man. Questions about that? Comments? So, the Christ is the Christ of God. Right. We carry on. The confession says, to whom? That is, to his son, as the God-man mediator, God gave from all eternity a people to be his seed or his offspring, and to be by him in due time redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified. Now then, I'm conscious we've not been looking at many proof texts or much in the way of scripture at the moment, but let's pick up this particular point here. He gave him from all eternity a people to be his seed. Can anybody recall... Words of Jesus during his ministry on earth in which he alludes to the idea of being given a people. Any occasion. Did Jesus ever make any allusion to a people being given to him? John 17. Do you remember the verse, Russell? John 17, verse 6 is... is um, one of them, I believe it's verse 6 in John 17, where <clears throat> in that great high priestly prayer, I revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, 
you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now, some folk, as they read that, say, well, Jesus is here just referring to the twelve. You recall that before the selection of the twelve, he went up onto the mountain and prayed and think, well, God told him who he was to choose as disciples. And so some folk could say this is just alluding to the fact that God told him to select the twelve. I think there's more in this than that. Where Jesus says, they were yours. They were yours. To me, that's an allusion to the fact that even in the councils of eternity, these were men whom God had set his love upon, his purposes upon. And in his all-determining election, God had given them to Christ. However, I think that that notion of a pre-temporal, pre-creative, pre-creation giving to the Son of people and the people to redeem. I think the clearest reference is in John chapter 6. Why don't we just have a look at a couple of these verses here that are well known to us. John chapter 6 <clears throat> verse 37. Jesus is speaking to crowds that have followed him across the lake back to Capernaum after he had fed the 5,000. And he chides and rebukes them for following him, not because they'd seen the signs, but just because they'd eaten. And he rebukes them for their blindness and the fact that in spite of everything he'd done, they'd not come to him and believed in him. And then in verse 37 he says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. You see, in these words, Jesus is again revealing this consciousness that he hasn't voluntarily come down to earth simply to undertake a rescue mission. He is coming down to fulfill the one or the will of the one who sent him. And that's reflecting, again, the fact that in his eternal purpose, God chose and ordained his son to be the mediator, part of the will, the purpose of the father who sent him. And he adds this in verse 39, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. And I will raise Him up at the last day. Now, can you see what Jesus is saying there? He's speaking out of a consciousness of having been given, entrusted, almost donated a people. And it is the Father's will that He should save them. And that He should raise them up on the last day. He's coming as the mediator to accomplish the purpose of his Father and the will of his Father. And that's behind this kind of statement here. To whom he gave from all eternity a people to be his seed and to be his offspring. That terminology here relates to Isaiah chapter 53, the great servant song in Isaiah where in the 10th verse of Isaiah 53, Isaiah, anticipating the coming of the servant of the Lord, says, uh, ba -ba -ba. <clears throat> Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will prolong his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And uh, yeah, in, the, in the older translations it has, he will see his seed, I believe. So that's the kind of notion here. God from all eternity gave him a people to be his seed and to be by him in due time redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified. Notice here, these are given to him in eternity to be redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified by him in time. So we've got a glorious picture unfolding here of God 
who determines and purposes still to relate to lost sinners, to do it through his Son, whom he's appointed to be the mediator, and to whom he's entrusted this great task of redeeming them and of saving them. A wonderful God-centered perspective of what's happening. Comments? Questions? Right. Well, looking at our notes again, I think you'll see that there's um, most of these things are covered here, and you'll see I've included a number of quotations that might help give a little bit more light on that. Okay, let's press on because we need to try and do two sections of these before the break, or two sections of this particular chapter before the break. There's more of it to come next week. The second one then looks at the person of the mediator of Christ. And we read this. The Son of God, the second person in the Trinity, being very and eternal God of one nature with the Father and equal with Him, took to Himself in God's appointed time man's nature with all the essential characteristics and common infirmities of His nature yet without sin, being conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary of her nature, so that two whole, perfect, and distinct natures, the divine and the human, were inseparably joined together without being changed, compounded, or fused in one person. This person is very God and very man, yet one Christ, the only mediator between God and man. Hey, do you go to bed thinking about those things, hey? <laughs> Isn't it a, an incredibly condensed statement? Here we have then, God, in His grace and mercy, determines to continue to relate to people. He relates through a third party, a mediator. In His grace, He appoints His own Son to be that mediator. Now, as we'll see a little bit later, in order to be an effective mediator between God on the one hand and man on the other hand, in order to be able to effect that reconciliation that satisfies divine justice and atones for human sin, the mediator's got to be a totally unique person. And this is where we're heading in this. The Son of God... And this is how we begin. The Son of God, the second person in the Trinity, being very an eternal God of one nature with the Father and equal with Him, so totally God. As, as God, do you think the Son could be an effective sin atoning mediator? Do you think He could be a sin atoning mediator for man, for sinful fallen man? Could He die? Well, anyway, you think about that. Talk with Tom Holland over the cup of tea time. He will tell you all the answers to that anyway. <laughs> In our understanding of Christian theology, the answer to that is no, that in order to become one who could represent man and could be a second Adam, who could stand at the head of the human race and speak of mankind, speak of you and me as his brothers as his brethren, himself had to become a man. And the second chapter of the book of Hebrews says, he didn't come to redeem angels, but he came to redeem us, descendants of Abraham, in order that the promises to Abraham might be fulfilled. So in order to be an effective high priest or mediator between God and man for the sons of Adam, he also had to become like us and take upon himself our nature. So here we are. The mediator, God chooses and ordains to stand in the gap between himself and sinful man, his son. And we learn here, being the second person in the Trinity of one nature with the Father and equal with them, he took to himself. Now, some of you guys that are sharp, come on Hamish, you're not allowed to... Uh, to get this past 
not, not allowed this to drift past you. Do you think that there is anything significant in the language there? Took to himself. Do you think there's anything significant in that particular language? We need to remember, particularly as we come into this section, that the writers of the Confession of Faith are conscious of historical errors, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a few moments. He took to himself, Hamish. Well, it's true that he's a, a willing participant in it, but also uh, counters the idea that the physical body was as an evil thing and what would be coming from God as God himself. Oh. Okay, Hamish has come up with a couple of suggestions. This expression, he took to himself, suggests firstly his willingness, and secondly the fact that there's nothing inherently sinful or evil in the human body. And those things are both true. Anything else? He took to himself. Yes, yeah. Well, as part of the Trinity, he was equal God, therefore. It was not put on him, he took it to himself. Yep. Yarp has said, and stressing the voluntary character of this again, that as part of the Trinity, he, he voluntarily, he didn't, it wasn't put upon him, but he himself did that. Okay, yeah. What do you think? If this had said, the Son of God became... No, that's not necessarily wrong, but if it had that idea of the Son of God became something else, you might almost have the impression, what, that the Son of God was transformed, was transformed or changed or became something less than divine. And we'll see one or two errors in that regard. Now, um, how do I put it? What are those things in Lord of the Rings that are less than human? Show my ignorance. Orcs. Orcs or something or other. Orcs. Orcs. There we are. So I'm not very cultured in this regard. Have I said that Merlin, instead of being a human person, became an orc? All right. We, we would say that she changed. But if we happen to say this, that Merlin was able to take to herself certain physical features of an orc, which she probably wouldn't want to do, but anyway, <laughs> if she would, is it possible that her essential person might remain the same, but she nevertheless took to herself something which she originally didn't have? Now, I think that that is, in the history of theology anyway, behind this kind of expression here, wanting to guard the notion there was any transformation in the essential, guard against the idea that there was any essential transformation in the person of the Son of God that might create the impression that he became less than God. So this is the way, historically, theologians have said it. The Son of God took to himself something he didn't previously have. And in doing so, he didn't cease to be the Son of God. But do you think it is true to say that with the incarnation, the eternal Son of God became something that he wasn't before? From that point of view of being the God-man, do you think Jesus was always possessing or always possessed a human nature as well as divine nature? No, he, he didn't. He took to himself the human nature as well. So here we are we're encountering an, an incredible thing that the Confession of Faith is talking about here. The eternal Son, equal with the Father, who couldn't die, who couldn't, as the eternal Creator God, stand before that eternal creator God and represent creature man. But there's this amazing thing happens. The eternal God takes to himself in God's appointed time man's nature with all the essential characteristics of that nature and the common infirmities of his nature yet without sin. Now, what do you think this terminology is mean? With all the essential characteristics of that nature. That one? That expression? What's it talking about? 
with all the essential characteristics of that nature. Guy, do you think that Jesus had a, a rational mind like ours that could see, could observe, and could count and say one plus one equals two? Do you think so? Yeah. Do you think he had the same kind of psyche or psychological properties in a sense that we are, that he could observe things and experience uh, grief? and sorrow and sadness do you think physiologically he could feel thirst and hunger yes. those things, do you think he could feel pain yes all of those things so he took upon himself man's nature with all the essential characteristics of that nature and, and, and embraced and entailed and common infirmities common infirmities like what do you think Thirst? Thirst? Hunger? Hunger? Uh, Pain? Tiredness? Fear? Even fear? No. Was that you, Ben? Ben. Ben mentioned fear. Do you think that Jesus, in assuming that human nature, also assumed the capacity to, to experience acute anxiety or distress? akin to fear in some ways my soul is what old translation I love it exceeding sorrowful unto death and uh, the Lord Jesus was able to enter into the whole realm of human experience so basically what the writers of the confession are wanting to say here is that that human nature that Jesus possessed was fully human fully human, not superhuman or subhuman, but fully human, except without sin. I was reading a book during the week by a, an older theologian who was a strong traducian. Know what that means? Now, well, he, he, he was a man who believed that in the generation of the human race, that traducianism has to do with the whole issue of the origin of the soul. Is the individual the result of a distinct creation? Or is the capacity for the natural, the generation of the human race and species within the actual being of people? So that's the traducian position. Fundamentally, that's oversimply stating. Anyway, and connected with that was the very, very strong idea that passed on from generation to generation is also the corruption which belongs to our character and our nature. And obviously and clearly in some sense or other, natural generation does result in original sin, as we've already seen, results in the corruption as well as, in corruption as, well as guilt. Now, what this is essentially and, 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 and emphasizing here is that Jesus possessed all of the essential characteristics and the natural and common infirmities of our nature, but not the corruption that is inherent in human nature uh, after the fall. Now, Tom and I were just discussing over lunchtime a little bit, and I've got this going through my mind here, and it's slightly not throwing me off track, but I'm, you know, I'd be interested to pursue this further with him sometime, just the essence of sin. Tom was mentioning this morning that sin's not woven into our genes. Is that right? It's not necessarily genetically, physically there, but nevertheless, it's not the fact that men are created in a state of righteousness or neutrality. All the offspring of Adam go astray from the womb. Is that, that correct? So we inherit corrupt nature. Jesus didn't, anyway. Kinship and likeness to us and essential characteristics and infirmities of nature, yet without the corrupting influence of sin. Now, how in the world is this possible? That Jesus could take upon himself human nature, possessing all its characteristics, yet without sin. We've got this down here. Being conceived by... The power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary 
of her nature. This mysterious, wonderful act of the conception of Jesus. It's an absolute marvel. Now, <clears throat> I'm sure that some of you are aware of the fact that within Roman Catholic theology, there have been various attempts to explain the perfection of Jesus. There's been notions of immaculate conception that relate to Mary's state of sinlessness, etc. And they've looked to the character and person of Mary to try and explain the sinless character of the person of Jesus. Our understanding is that the sinlessness of Jesus is guaranteed by the involvement and action of the Holy Spirit. You recall in the Annunciation to Mary that the angel Gabriel says to her, Luke chapter 1, verse 30, But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, you found favor with God. You'll be with child and give birth to a son. And then a little further down, verse 35, the angel answers to her when she says, how can, I, how can this happen since I'm a virgin? She says, the Holy, he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One or that holy thing to be born shall be called the Son of God. Traditional Orthodox Protestant theology has maintained that the perfection of Jesus is not to be explained in terms of the perfection of Mary, but in terms of the sanctifying involvement of the Holy Spirit in the conception of the Lord Jesus. That's right, Tom, is it not? That's fundamentally right, perhaps not adequately explained, but fundamentally, hopefully, on track there. Now, the, the interesting thing is, particularly here, by the power of the Holy Spirit and the womb of the Virgin Mary and of her nature. Again, just in this morning we were reminded that the book of Romans begins with these words concerning the Lord Jesus. The gospel that Paul's been set apart to regards the Son of God who as to his human nature was the descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God. Jesus was a descendant of David according to his human nature. That is, he, he, Jesus did assume to himself a genuine human nature, Mary's nature, or of Mary, of her physical nature. Let's have a look at what this says perhaps over here in our notes. If we can just pick this up, if I can find this. I've got uh, something there. Here we are, page four. Can you turn to your notes, page four? And we'll have a look at what one or two folk have said here. Because I think this is a, a mysterious, but at the same time particularly wonderful point. We're looking at the fact that he was sinless, and I've got, so that's point C, and I've got point 1. This was secured by a supernatural conception in the womb of the Virgin Mary. 2, his conception was of her actual substance. And we've got this statement. The body of Christ was not created out of nothing. Okay? Was not created out of nothing. Neither did it descend from heaven but it was formed by the agency of the Holy Spirit of the substance of the Virgin. Hence Mary was called the mother of Jesus, and he is called the fruit of her womb and the seed of the woman. Again, the human race, or the human nature of Jesus is not an independent creation merely, but it was generated out of the common life of our race of the very substance of the Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Ghost. Do you think it would have been true to say, and perhaps I might be out of court here and I can be corrected afterwards, but do you think that if Jesus had been DNA tested, that there would have been linkages with Mary? 
I think so. I understand that that's exactly what that's talking about here. Once again, we've got Tom Wilkinson saying it's wrong to imagine that Jesus was sinless because he was born of a virgin. For this implies that original sin is only transmitted by the male, and it fails to take seriously that Mary was sinful like the rest of the race. Freedom from sin and his birth and life was due to the presence and work of the Holy Spirit and not to the purity of Mary's life. It was her physical substance that Jesus, human nature, developed embryonically. But the Holy Spirit was active in the conception, sanctifying that so it was properly a holy seed that Mary gave birth to. But here we are in this incredible work of mediating between the infinite eternal God and sinful man, the second person of the Trinity takes to himself a human nature like ours and yet without sin and he does so through the amazing mysterious conception by the Spirit in the womb of Mary. So that is the result. The result of the incarnation, you'll see I've gotten a summary along the side, so that what we have is two whole, perfect, and distinct natures, the divine and the human. These were inseparably joined together without being changed, compounded, or fused in one person. Perhaps we can wait until after... Uh, We've had a tea break to explore this a little bit more fully. I've got an acetate, an overhead, with some diagrams from Wayne Grudem's systematic theology that helpfully portray some of the historical errors in trying to understand what we're looking at here. But just as we try to grasp what is written here, one of the things you've got to note are these two words, natures and person. The historically, theologians have been careful to define and to make that distinction between a person, which is a personal, conscious subsistence. One person, that's the ego, it's the I. When you say I, you're talking about you, talking about you as a person. Do you have multiple persons? Do you talk about, if I was to talk to, to Yulia and I said, Yulia, uh, we have decided to come and visit you next week. Now, you might say, that's all right, speaking about a family. Maybe if you're royalty, you're using a royal we. But we don't talk that way as individuals, do we? Say, I, because so, we, we are unipersonalities, uniperson, one, one person, one personal subsistence, one personal self-consciousness. I mean, when pain uh, when you register pain, you don't have one part of you feels pain and then another part of you feels, you know, another, another of you says, oh, I feel pained as well by that. And a third person, and so you talk to each other. Some of us talk to ourselves, but that's a sign of age. <laughs> but we don't, as a rule, converse within two or three persons within us, do we? No, we, we are one person. And as we exist, we exist, our self-consciousness expresses itself through a human mind, and we have human affections, we have a human consciousness, a human will, human body, those sorts of things. We just go on nature. So we talk about a person that is a personal identity and, and subsistence or existence, if you like, existing in human nature, person and nature. Historically, theologians have been very careful about that, and they talk about just the one person, the eternal Son of God, just always one person who existed eternally in what kind of nature in a what do we call that nature as eternal existence has ever been within a divine nature with all the perfections equal in power and glory with father and with son but in time, he assumes and takes to himself a human nature as well. Do you think he ceases to be divine? Do you think that even during his time on earth, the Lord Jesus was still 
the omnipotent, omnipresent, omnipowerful Son of God. It's, it's so incredibly difficult for us to conceive. But yes, he was. He didn't cease to be wholly divine when he took to himself a human nature. Any less than now. Do you think the Lord Jesus still has a human nature now? Do you, do you think so? When he comes again, will he still have... Yes, he does. He took to himself a human nature. And we've got here, so that the eternal Son of God has two whole, that means completely divine still. He didn't have to chip away a bit of the divine nature, if I can say that reverently, in order to make room for the human, which is sort of like putty over the crack then, to say, well, you've got the, basically the divine nature, and then where he yielded a bit of his divine nature, the human's inserted there some way. Completely unchanged, completely whole, perfect, distinct, divine and human. They were inseparably joined together without being changed, compounded or fused. But in one person. So one person now has two natures. And amazingly, in ways that really do stretch us and are beyond us, that divine person, in his personal self-consciousness, can have a divine consciousness and a divine knowledge and awareness, but also can have a human, finite consciousness, or at least finite knowledge and awareness of things. Amazing. The one person having both divine and human consciousness. Now that's, that's amazing, this sort of thing. And these terms here have been hammered out, particularly in the 5th century. These two were joined together without being changed, compounded, or fused in the one person. Now, after the break, I'll slip up this overhead with diagrams from Wayne Grudem to uh, illustrate ways in which historically people have grappled to try to understand this absolute wonder how the eternal son in being equipped as it were or in becoming or assuming the role of mediator takes upon himself human nature can I just ask as we finish this you're probably bored out of your minds and confused by this I hope not but at the same time, are you able to have at least some consciousness of the immensity of what's happening here? There, there is something astonishingly wonderful happening. The eternal God and the person of the Son of God is, is stooping. Do you think that there is an act of humiliation involved or do you think there's an act of humbling involved to take upon himself the form of a servant as well does Philippians 2 tell us that it does and I, I think we need to see that rather than just thinking Jesus my saviour and my lord and only just thinking of Jesus from our point of view standing back and seeing the incredible drama from God's point of view of a mediator between himself and man. It's going to be the Son of God. And to do that, he has to assume also human nature so that he, that eternal Son, can also be man in perfection and represent us. There is something incredible, marvelous happening in the assumption of human nature to himself. And uh, this is the kind of thing which we will see, I th I'm sure, much more clearly uh, as we enter into the fuller light and sight of things uh, at the return of the Lord Jesus. But wonderful, wonderful things are involved in our salvation. So why don't we drink, refresh, come back at quarter past, and try and pick up and continue this study through. Thank you. Ben and Barbara, still with us. And... Uh,
We're grappling with just the mystery and the wonder of the incarnation. Perhaps, sorry, let me check. Um, Alan, you, you're with us way down south? Ben and Barbara, can you hear me? What about Ernie, you with us? And Alan, still with us? Well, I hope he's not dropped off down there at Knighton. We'll press on. We're looking still at this mystery. Jesus, in assuming this role of mediator, assumes to himself human nature and grappling just with this, the mystery, the wonder, the, the hypostatical union, as it's called, the union of the two natures of Jesus, it's called that in theology anyway, an element that defies our comprehension entirely. But notice the points here, whole, perfect, distinct natures. In your notes on page four, which I'm assuming that you're going to read, you'll see under point D, I've got one, the two natures of the mediator were whole and perfect. Two, they were inseparably joined together in his one person. Made a little error in copying a note there. Just under that statement it says, Jesus was not some who was less than God. It really should read, Jesus was not somewhat less or someone who was less than God. Probably better. Jesus was not someone who was less than God, nor was he somewhat less than man. So just correct that a little bit there. And then this other point, that the two natures of Christ remain distinct without conversion, composition, or confusion. And in the note here, Wilkinson helps us explain that. He says, without conversion is intended to rule out the idea that either the deity was swallowed up by the humanity, or vice versa. Without composition rejects the notion that the two natures were joined together like Siamese twins, somehow compounded together so a new amalgam was made. Without confusion guards against the error of thinking that the two natures were somehow mixed together to form a third kind of being who was neither God nor man. And you see below that, the doctrine of the person of Christ was an article of contention between the 5th and the 7th centuries. Several heresies arose amongst people at that particular time. And this is where I'll slip this diagram up, give you a change of things to look at. Here we have four different diagrams that Wayne Grudem uses to try to express these different views. And I'll just read what these are very briefly. This first one, Apollinarianism, that's a real tongue twister for you to say. Apollinarius became bishop in Laodicea about A.D. 361. And he taught, Grudem says, that the one person of Christ had a human body, this part over here, he had a human body, but not a human mind or spirit and that the mind and spirit of the Christ were from the divine nature of the Son of God. Okay, so you had a composite being that had a human body, but basically the mind and the spirit were divine. And that was one era that was repudiated. Then there's a second, Nestorianism, which says that basically you have got two separate persons in Christ. Nestorianism is the doctrine that there were two separate persons in Christ, a human person and a divine person, a teaching that is distinct from the biblical view that sees Jesus as one person. So this was a way in which some people tried to understand the incarnation. As a result of that, you had the divine Son of God, but you also had another person, Jesus, Son of Mary. And you had two persons within the Christ, theoretically, could have been able to talk to, it, to themselves or to each other. This is monophysitism or Eutychianism, where you've got human nature and divine nature kind of mixed together, or shall we say something like hot water and cold water mixing to give you something new, say warm water or something like that. Uh, where there is a m melting and a kind of merging and a confusion of the two natures so that the new nature was not entirely human but also not entirely divine. 
It has been diluted by the human, so it is sub-divine, but the human's been exalted by the divine, so that it's supra-human. So what you end up with is one nature, uh, one new nature. All right? Appreciate that? And down the bottom. <coughs> this is Grudem's attempt to represent the unrepresentable. Uh, the Chalcedonian Christology. In 451, there was a council of the church that met from October the 1st, I think it was, to November the 8th, 451. And that council of the church hammered out a statement, which is um, the Chalcedonian Creed. It's sometimes called, I won't read it because its terminology is quite compressed. The Confession of Faith is a, a simpler, or at least a, a clearer statement of it. But here, this is how Grudem tries to represent it. This complete circle here is seeking to represent within the one divine nature the tri-personal being of our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The person of the Son assuming to himself human nature so that he doesn't lose his divine nature but now also has assumed. So you've got the one person of Christ with both human nature and divine. That's his attempt to represent that kind of thing. Over against the notion that the Christ, Jesus, had a physical body, but really the rest of him was divine. Or against the notion that in the person of Jesus that people saw walking around Galilee, or within, sorry, the figure that they saw walking around Galilee, there was a human person and a divine person, two persons in the one. And over against the notion that, yes, this is a hybrid mixture of divine and human. Rather, we're talking about one person, wholly human, unmingled, unconfounded, unmixed, undiluted, unconfused, and also at the same time divine completely divine. Now, we're not even going to begin to talk about, um, well, we'll talk about next week a little bit, uh, ways in which sometimes Jesus is alluded to or spoken of as the divine Son of God, but spoken of as the one who's experiencing human uh, feelings and struggles as well. So the Son of God, so sometimes the divine name is used to identify the person in human experiences. But that's, we'll, we'll talk about that next week. A bit complex at the moment. Why don't we just stick this? Any questions about that? Do you see what this is talking about? Trying to understand as best we can how one person possesses two natures. Unmingled, unmixed. Right. Why don't we just press on then and um, come back, look at this, so that this person, we learn down the bottom here, is in the end very God and very man, both. God, man, the anthropos. Yet one Christ. Now the term Christ here means anointed, it's the name. Uh, of the Lord Jesus, it's used most commonly amongst us and most commonly perhaps in the New Testament as a proper name for Jesus, but the Christ is the anointed, the Messiah, the God-man mediator. So he is one Christ, the only mediator between God and man. Okay, so this God-man becomes God's mediator. Let's press on and look at the next thing we have to consider in the next article of the Confession concerning the Mediator's Person. I've entitled it, Christ as Mediator. What have we got? The Lord Jesus, in His human nature, thus united to the divine, 
was set apart to his mediatorial office and anointed with the Holy Spirit beyond measure, having in him all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, in whom it pleased the Father that all the fullness of the Godhead should dwell bodily, so that, being holy, without guilt, undefiled, and full of grace and truth, he might be thoroughly equipped to perform the office of a mediator and surety. This office he did not take upon himself, or he did not upon, take it upon himself to undertake, but was called to it by his father, who put all authority and judgment into his hand and gave him command, the commandment to exercise authority and execute judgment. Again, just a massively compressed statement. I personally think that some of these statements on Christ as mediator we're looking at are amongst the most compressed and densest of <clears throat> the entire confession. They contain an enormous number of very important ideas. <coughs> Let's try to understand them. God chooses to relate to man through mediator and enter into covenant through a mediator. He chooses and appoints his son to be that mediator. The son who was ever eternally God it takes to himself human nature. Now we learn the Lord Jesus in his human nature thus united to his divine. I think we need to be aware of the fact that here the focus is upon the human nature of Jesus. We could ask this, do you think the divine nature of Jesus in any sense needed to be anointed with the Holy Spirit and power? Not at all. But his human nature, it is proper to speak of that being wonderfully united, uh, wonderfully anointed with the Holy Spirit. Here we've got the Lord Jesus in his human nature, thus united to the divine, was set apart to his mediatorial office. Was there a point in time in Jesus' earthly career where there was a dedication, where there was a consecration, where there was a point where he begins to undertake and fulfill the role of the servant son of God? His baptism is certainly a very significant moment in that sense. And even the words that God uses or that Jesus hears from heaven are what? This is my son in whom I am well pleased. A fusion together of a couple of quotations from the book of Isaiah. Oh, sorry. Isaiah 42 verse 1 and Psalm chapter 2. Oh, my son, this day I have begotten thee. And uh, behold my servant whom I uphold, and whom is more my delight, etc. God is bringing those things together and saying effectively, this, this one who is anointed with the Holy Spirit is my Redeemer, Messiah, Mediator, Christ, who is undertaking this great work. So, showing potential basically as a child when he was in the temple after he was lost? Sure. Yes. Gift yeah. the Absolutely. So that's, I think that even right from the very beginning, Jesus was certainly endowed with grace and knowledge and insight. He was always God's appointed Messiah. And there were certainly outflashings of that evidently in that early stage. But this, I think, his baptism does, or is commonly, Tom, am I correct in this, is generally understood as marking the formal commencement of Jesus' work as representative head mediator of his people. And so we have that understanding that he was set apart to his mediatorial office and anointed with the Holy Spirit beyond measure. That's terminology taken from John chapter 3 in particular, when John the Baptist is giving testimony concerning Jesus, saying, Father has put all things into his hands, and he has given him the Holy Spirit without measure. So he is anointed. Luke chapter 10 verse 38 tells us, as Peter speaks to Cornelius, and he says to him, 
You've heard these things about Jesus of Nazareth who was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power and went about Galilee doing good. So the human nature of Jesus, Jesus as he was beheld and seen and observed by the people of his day, Jesus according to his divine nature, his human nature was indeed anointed with the Holy Spirit without measure and had in him all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, in whom, in that figure that people saw and beheld, in him it could be said all the fullness of the Godhead was pleased to dwell bodily as he walks, lives, and ministers. So that, as a consequence of that marvelous, mysterious composition of his person with divine and human natures, the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the setting apart by God to be the mediator, being holy, without guilt, undefiled and full of grace and truth, he becomes thoroughly equipped to perform the office of a mediator and a surety. So he is God and man he is endowed with the Holy Spirit, anointed with the Holy Spirit, full of grace and truth, full of wisdom and knowledge, perfectly equipped to be both a mediator and a surety. Now we'll come to a moment, in a, uh, the term surety in a moment, but <clears throat> can you appreciate that this God-man is, is able to... Um, he is able to interpose between God and man. Both of those. He, he, is, he is uniquely constituted so that he can certainly represent God to man, can commune, can be the prophet of God to man, but he can also stand as man's representative before God. Incredibly, wonderfully, perfectly equipped. Let's just think just one other thing for a moment. Do you think if there was perhaps just a sinful man, sorry, a sinless man, let's suppose the possibility existed theory, hypothetically. We know it doesn't theologically and in reality, but just suppose Jesus was just a man, a sinless, holy, pure man. Do you think as a sinless, holy, pure man he could fulfill all the requirements of the mediator to bring about the reconciliation of God and man? Do you think he could have endured what was involved in being made sin for us? Perhaps it's wrong to speculate hypothetically, but the amazing, you see something in the notes I've quoted from one particular man, might have been an older divine, I forget who it was, but certainly the older understanding was that None less than the mediator could bear the sins of the world and satisfy divine justice completely. As a mere man could. Christine, you wanted to say something or not? I just want to say that a mere man couldn't represent God to the people. Correct. So that's right. The two way kind of thing couldn't be there. Let's pick up just this word surety. Anybody know what that means? What's a surety? Surety. John? What's a surety? If you stand as surety for me in a business venture or transaction or something or other, what does that mean? Guarantor. Guarantor. You're using one abstract word to define another one. That's good, good ploy, good politician. What's a surety? You put down the money for somebody else. Okay. Put down the money for somebody else, Isabel says. Come on, Caleb. Surety. You become liable. Ah, you become liable. Now, I've got a little bit displaced in the notes over here, I think. Why don't you just turn for a second to be to the top of page 7. Robert Shaw has given us, or at least has this definition of a surety. It's, it's a term we don't use that frequently today, but... Here we read this. A surety is one who engages to pay a debt or to suffer a penalty incurred by another. 
such a surety is our Lord Jesus Christ. He undertook in the everlasting covenant to be responsible to the law and justice of God for that boundless debt which his elect were bound to pay. And having become the surety by his father's appointment and by his own voluntary engagement, their guilt was legally transferred to him, and all his obedience and sufferings in their nature should be were vicarious or in the room of those he represented before God. As I understand it, again, a surety is basically somebody who does stand ready to be a liability for another. That's a good, good term. And for Jesus to be the surety of his people is one who is able to stand in their place and to take upon himself the debt or the guilt that was theirs. Not quite the same nuance or idea as mediator. Mediator having the notion of a go-between one who is able to effect reconciliation. So I think the dominant idea behind mediator is one who is able to establish peace between alienated parties. But a surety is one who can stand in the place of and uh, be liable for the guilt of another. So what this is saying is that in this incredible way, in the taking upon himself of our nature and then of being set apart to that office formally and being anointed with the Holy Spirit beyond measure, Jesus was perfectly constituted to fulfill that role of being a mediator. Comments, questions, can you see that? <clears throat> right, the last bit we've got here is he did not take it upon himself to undertake, or the, sorry, this office, this office, he, the Lord Jesus, did not take it upon himself to undertake. In Hebrews chapter 5, we've got a very explicit reference to that. Every high priest is selected from amongst men, Hebrews 5 verse 1, and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God. <clears throat> then in verse 4, No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he said in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So the confession of faith is picking up on that note and saying, okay, Jesus gloriously, that the whole constitution of his person to be this mediator is something that's been part of the eternal purpose of God. In time it takes place, but in all of these things the Lord Jesus did not presumed to take upon himself these things, but was called to them, set apart to them by his Father, who put all authority and judgment into his hand. Now, let's just pause there for a moment. I wonder if you can just turn back to me this, this glorious passage in John chapter 3. I, I think... Uh, one of the most wonderful uh, testimonies that John the Baptist gives to Jesus in his ministry is found in these verses, verse 27 of chapter 3. Perhaps you recall the background of this. Jesus or his disciples have been baptizing in Judean countryside. One of John the Baptist's followers comes to John saying, look, the one that you baptized on the other side of the Jordan, he's baptizing people and everybody's flocking to him. And John replies, verse 27, let's follow this through because it's a magnificent passage. John replied, a man can receive only what is given him from heaven, verse 27. You yourselves can testify that I said I am not the Christ, 
but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. So John first addresses this this uh, question of one of his followers in terms of himself and his status and his role. And he says, you, you know, I've always said I wasn't the bridegroom. I was the bridegroom's friend. And I'm very, very glad that the bridegroom's here and the bridegroom is indeed gathering his bride, as it were. But then look at what he says, verse 31. The one who comes from above. That's a way of saying the one who is eternal God the one who is the eternal son. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth speaks to the, uh, belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. But the one who comes from heaven is above all. And in that expression, the one who comes from heaven, John is, is, is gathering this whole idea of the incarnation. He comes and the word becomes flesh. That's what he said in John chapter 1. So the one who comes from heaven is the eternal word who does become flesh. The one who, uh, who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard. This is the prophetic office, if you like, of the mediator. He is able to testify to what he has seen and heard. But no one accepts his testimony. The man who has accepted it is certified that God is truthful. Now look at this. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. Now, what that basically is saying is what this is saying here. God put all authority... We'll talk about judgment in a minute. All authority in his hands. That's what Jesus confessed to his disciples as he was leaving them, or at least as Matthew ends his gospel account. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. He is recognizing that God has put the control, the government, and the ordering of... Uh, all the, the work of the mediator into God's hand, and into G Jesus' hands. He's, he's been given authority and power as the mediator. The other point is judgment. If you just turn over to John chapter 5, you recall at, um, when Jesus was in Jerusalem again and healed that man by the pool of Siloam on the Sabbath. And Jesus contends and affirms there that he's always at work as his father's at work and the Jews want to stone him because they recognize that he is in calling God his father. He is making a claim to divinity. And Jesus, as he uh, responds to that and speaks about it, he can do nothing apart from the father. In the 21st verse he says, For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So here Jesus is again reflecting this enormous dignity of his role as the mediator, the one, this God-man to whom God has given all authority, but all power and heaven and earth being given unto him and judgment being given to him as well. Not only that, uh, so he has put all authority and judgment and gave him the commandment to exercise authority and to execute judgment. All right. Hope I've not lost you here. This marvelous God-man, mediator, thoroughly equipped, didn't undertake that work and role himself, appointed to it by his father, given command, all authority given to him, judgment put into his hands. 
It's probably best if we do just flow on and try in these last minutes to finish this last section because it just carries on and looks at the work as mediator. I think you'll see these sections we've been looking at are um, describing and unfolding for us the person of Christ as the mediator. What about his work? This office of being the mediator, the Lord Jesus most willingly undertook. It was of the Father's ordaining, choice, appointment. Jesus most willingly undertook that. Psalm 40 reminds us of that. It's also cited again in Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offering and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then he said, Here am I. Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. The servant of the Lord coming gladly to assume the work of this office. What have we got? He most willingly undertook it, and that he might discharge it, what? He was born subject to the law and perfectly fulfilled it. He endured most grievous distresses directly in his soul and most painful sufferings in his body. He was crucified and died. He was buried and remained under the power of death, yet his body experienced no decay. On the third day he rose from the dead with the same body in which he suffered, with which also he ascended into heaven, and there sits at the right hand of his Father, interceding. And he shall return to judge men and angels at the end of the world. That gives us a magnificent prospectus of the mediator's calling or task. Now, we're not going to go through each of those painstakingly, but it really is worthwhile, again, just seeing this full-orbed picture and perspective. He was born subject to the law and perfectly fulfilled it. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, tells us that in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made what? Made under the law, that He might what? Redeem those who were under the law. Wonderful words. What have we got? NIV puts it, but when the time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons, to redeem, to let loose those who were under the bondage and penalty of the law. Jesus Himself came made under the law, to fulfill the law perfectly, that the whole moral requirement that God had of man. He came to be perfect man, to fulfill the older. Covenantal theologians say that Jesus came to fulfill the demands of the original covenant of works. He came as the second Adam to provide the perfect and full obedience. It's interesting as we as we, we look at Matthew's gospel and uh, we see there that as the Lord Jesus is <clears throat> baptized and we see it in all the synoptics, that immediately after assuming, as it were, publicly the ministry of the mediator, what's the first thing that happens? He is taken into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan. In a sense, almost a reproduction of the temptation of Adam. And here we've got the mediator fulfilling all righteousness and able to do what Adam couldn't do. So, what was required of the Lord to be perfect man and to be able to represent man perfectly before God as one having completely fulfilled what manhood and humanity 
was demanded of, he had to walk before God and be perfect. Just as Abraham was asked and required to do, as Adam was, Adam was essentially told in the garden, walk before me and be perfect. Abraham had those words expressly stated to him. Jesus coming, born of a woman, born under the law, had to do that too, to walk before God and be perfect and fulfill it to complete and bring to fulfillment all that was required. So that was one thing. His mediatorial role required perfect obedience to the law. Secondly, it involved him enduring these grievous distresses directly in his soul and in the sufferings of his body connected with being subjected to death and death for sin. Next week we have a look at the atonement and the mediator's atonement but this is just listing here what was involved in his the performance of his mediatorial role. He was crucified and died. So these things belong especially to his vicarious suffering and his sin atoning sacrifice as mediator. He was buried and remained under the power of death, yet his body experienced no decay. Michael, you just imagine that you're applying for a job and uh, it sounds pretty good. Lots of responsibility, a company car and everything. You say, well, would you just tell me what's expected of me? What's my job description? And uh, your employer begins to reel off everything that's involved. And as he goes through it and say, well, I expect 85 hour weeks. Uh, travel away from Auckland uh, three weeks out of five. And you say, hey, I've just got engaged, got a sweetheart, got to arrange a marriage, establish a marriage, and on it goes. In a sense, what we've got here is a listing of the undertakings that were involved in Jesus being this mediator between God and man, fulfilling the law, enduring grievous sufferings, dying and being buried. And, and even this, you, you think about this, this, this is the eternal Son of God, the creator of the, the heavens and the earth, having to be subject not simply to death, but also to three days under the power of death, yet his body not seeing corruption. The incredible humiliation of the Son to undertake this as a mediatorial. This, this is a colossal work, is it not? This is a colossal undertaking. On the third day, rising from the dead with the same body he suffered, ascending into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father, there interceding the mediatorial work of Christ also involves his constant intercession you see in the notes I've got a quotation that indicates that his intercession bears and relates particularly to the gathering in of his elect people. Again, the gospel according to John. Recall that Jesus, just as he looks beyond his death to his glorification, says, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may also glorify you. You've granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all that you have given him. Now, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus longs for his glorification with the Father in order that he might give glory to the Father by seeing the salvation of all the Father had given to him. And his intercessory work is concerned even with the salvation of those the Father has given to him. Their uh, preservation, their sanctification, their calling, etc. So his ministry continues in heaven interceding and ultimately he shall return to judge men and angels at the end of the world. So his glorious mediatorial office. Obedience, atonement, intercession, 
ultimately judgment and I think that it's in the light of all that we come to a, just a final reference for the night and that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 because I think that this represents the finale where we read that in verse 22, what have we got of chapter 15? For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. These two great figures in the history of the world, Adam and Christ. In Adam all died, in Christ all are made alive. But we read this, uh, but... But verse 23, but each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, being made alive, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign, that is, he must have this position of mediatorial glory and authority and rule and sovereignty. He must continue to exercise that until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Verse 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now, when it says that everything has been put under him, it's clear that this doesn't include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. That passage, again, an element of mystery and wonder in it, but it seems to point to a point of completion when Jesus, who exercises mediatorial sovereignty and rule and dominion over all things, will have completed God's mediatorial purpose and function for him in putting all his enemies under his feet, having reconciled all things in heaven and earth unto the God again. And then we're told he will himself become subject to God, that God might be all and in all. Again, I might be wrong, but I understand, and certainly the theologians I've read understand that. Jesus will not always fulfill the office of mediator. Is that right, Tom? In the sense in which certainly he fulfills it now. But he will fulfill his mediatorial assignment, complete it. When all authority and all powers put under his feet, he delivers the perfected kingdom up to God. And then we're told, God is all and in all. Jesus shall continue to be God-man throughout endless ages of eternity. He will always be the bride or groom of the bride, the bridegroom of the bride. Uh, but... His mediatorial work will come to its finality and completion. All right. You've been patient through what's been a, a heavy evening. Maybe not handled that particularly well. But I hope you go away with a, an appreciation of Christ, the Messiah, in the purposes of God which is glorious, amazing, wonderful. I hope you go away appreciating how beggarly the idea is that remains just basically that conception that just remains, Jesus, yes, he's my savior. He died for me so that I can go to heaven. Now, wonderfully true as that is, it is uh, nevertheless a very man-centered and in a sense partial and an inadequate view. But when we see things the way the Confession of Faith unfolded that for us tonight, the Creator God, in grace, love, and mercy, eternally in His counsel, in time and reality, reaches out to the world that He loves in the person of His Son, whom He has appointed and ordained to be a mediator between God and man, the one mediator, the only mediator between God and man, and who in his unique, amazing, wonderful purpose, person, 
brings about that reconciliation of all things to the Father. That is a great picture. Glorious, glorious picture. One that we will never, ever tire of praising and glorifying God for throughout creation, throughout the endless ages, and in a sense also ever understanding more of the glory and the mystery and the wonder of God's great salvation. He shall provide a mediator, surety, a substitute, he should take his own son and make him that mediator that we might be reconciled to him. What a wonderful salvation. That's the kind of thing that's made the hymn writers write the great hymns they have and the great psalms that have come out of the Christian church have uh, grown out of that kind of awareness of how great our God is and how great our salvation is. All right, I hope that's helped you see a little bit more of that anyway. Let's close in prayer, shall we? And finish on that note. Heavenly Father, we can only appreciate these things perhaps imperfectly, but we appreciate them clearly enough to see that you are a God of astonishing grace, astonishing wisdom, astonishing goodness, astonishing greatness. And we thank you tonight with all our hearts for so great a salvation and for so great a Savior. We look forward to exploring further the work of Christ as our mediator. But we long that even as we go away tonight, we may realize indeed how wonderful he is and how enormously privileged we are to be his seed, his offspring, his body, and to be in Christ as we were once in Adam. So for these things we thank you and bless you and praise you. And Lord, we do just pray that you would grip us with these realities that, and through your Holy Spirit empower us and fire us with a courage that would enable us to take the mystery of God and Christ to the world. For we pray it in his name. Amen. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ernie and Ellen, Ben and Barbara. Look forward to seeing you or being in touch again next week, same time. Thank you.